podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And we're up to 108 now. God. Yeah. So this episode, I'm looking forward to this one, Bob. This one, you titled Injunctions and How to Deal with Them. I title most of them, don't I? You do. You title them all. <laughs> Not most of them. Every single one is yours. <laughs> well, yes, I've titled this one as well. Because when I um, started to be a therapist, I trained in transaction analysis. And, f- you know, for many, many years. And so uh, when I work as a therapist, and I still do occasionally, um, TA is my default model even yeah. though I trained in integrative psychotherapy for a long time as well. And when I started uh, uh, with transaction analysis, uh, one of the th- first things I was taught, um, besides how to work with ego states, uh, that's the PAC model, was to look for what was called scripts, which are an unconscious life plan decided early in childhood, which we enact throughout life. And also to look for what makes up a script. And that was the early decisions that people made. So when clients come through the door in therapy, um, I'm always thinking about the early decisions that they made back in their childhood, which were survival decisions really then, but actually are perhaps outdated now. Yeah. And need updating. So I'm always looking at that and I'm looking at what, what is beneath the um, decisions, really. And they're the, uh, how can I explain this? The injunctions and drivers in transaction analysis. So the injunctions would be the messages that you couldn't follow in your script. And the drivers were the parental messages of, yes, these are the things for you to do, really. And uh, you'd have been taught this as well, wouldn't you? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So how do you see injunctions then? I thought we'd talk a little bit about them because as a TA therapist, I always look out for injunctions and how to help a person move away from injunctions because injunctions are inhibiting to life growth, if you like, yeah. inhibiting to healthy decisions. So I always look for injunctions. So how, how would you describe injunctions then from your frame of reference? I think one of the things that I always say is that the the kind of unconscious messages that we pick up from our parents, so they're not direct messages that our parents say to us or our main caregivers, but we kind of pick them up along the way. And, and yeah, they're always negative as well. That's one of the things, you know what I mean? I can remember when I learned about these that they were quite depressing. They, they all start with the don't. <laughs> Um, yeah. which stood out for me yeah and yeah they're, they're just the messages that we pick up as we're going along oh, oh, that's right so psychologically yeah uh transaction analysis gives us a personality model and a way of looking at how the past affects the present yeah and you're quite right that developmentally we pick up on these in Junctions, which are unconsciously and sometimes consciously, but mostly unconsciously, passed down from our parents, and then we—they are all negative. So that even we, like for example, uh, don't express feelings. Let's say that is one of them. Yeah. So we're sort of programmed in a way to, uh, and we decide that we decide that as well. So the messages we get passed down, we then decide are part of our own personality, if you like. So expressing feelings doesn't give us any recognition from our caretakers um so we i'll say program because i think it's a good word really um so we tell ourselves not to express feelings yeah for example so they are decisions in a way because we decide to follow them but they exactly. yeah actually programmed in a way and become part of our how we see the world early on in life 
So uh, Eric Byrne, who was the originator of transaction analysis, came up with a whole category of injunctions, and I'm sure there are many more. But I was thinking of 10 I was taught. So I thought we could give ourselves a little bit of, um, I would say, a test, but we could actually look at if we could name them for, for, for the readers. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a few, and you could sort of fill some in, see if we can get to 10. So if we look at this category, one of the major decisions or injunctions passed on to us, which often be, it became the hub of a negative life plan, would be don't exist. Yeah, that was the one that really shocked me. I can remember when when I heard that, when I was like, wow, that's that's quite depressing, that one. <laughs> so how do you, how, how would a, just to help the podcast people with you, perhaps don't know TA, how, Jackie, uh, would you spot as somebody who's got a don't exist? In other words, somebody who comes in with those sorts of unconscious decisions that are underpinning their personality, how would they be, do you think? Um, they, they would be quite depressed. They'd be quite down on themselves, sabotage themselves. Do you know what I mean? Kind of just, yeah, they're always looking on the dark side of things. Yeah, and they'd probably be um, very much attached to addiction, harmful behaviours, yeah. um, attempting not to be in the world. Yeah. Feel useless that. and unlovable and just, yeah. Feeling useless, unlovable, believing... They don't have a value in the world. Yeah. And usually the sort of unconscious messages would pass down a model to them um, in terms of, well, you know, well, you might as well not be here. You know, you aren't important. You don't do anything useful to the family, uh, XXX. So the person may easily decide then that, well, I might as well not exist. So they then have that in the, the underpinning of their psychological spirit. So then very little self-esteem grows. Yeah. Position. They don't believe they have any value. Usually feel, as you just said, worthless and down. And really don't put any um, consequence on healthy behaviours. Yeah. And don't exist as a really powerful one, which in some form or other, um, we all may have a flavour of, I think. Um, Another really lethal uh, message we might give to ourselves um, in response to the model, modelling from um, our significant parents, if they model down, uh, don't be you. Yeah. Or a variant, don't be yourself. Yeah. So that's in the remit, I think, almost of don't exist because it's a, it's a sort of model that, or message which is passed out, which is... Uh, don't be you. Whatever you do around here isn't good enough. Yeah. I mean, another third one would be don't be you. Do what I want you to be. Yeah. So don't be you. Do what I say. Really. Yeah. Not one of the things that I thought about that, I can remember when I was doing my training, was that, you know, my dad, I've got an older sister, and my dad always wanted a boy, and he had me, which was another daughter. So it was kind of like, I always got a sense of that. Is that potentially what I had because I was born the wrong sex, you know, because he really wanted a boy and got me. So it's like, don't be who you are. Oh, oh. I mean, a very powerful example. And um, a psychotherapist would really reflect on that with you and dialogue on that with you and um, see what sort of unconscious processes or how it's affected or enacted out your life today. I was a real tomboy when I was younger. Do you know oh. what I mean? I didn't like wearing girly things. I wasn't a girly girl. I was definitely a tomboy. So, I, I you know, unconsciously, I, I suppose I did pick up on that. Yeah. Well, you know, it would be hard. Well, I think somebody who passes down that type of modelling uh, to their, their children, it's not surprising then the child picks up on that and may think they're a disappointment to their father or may make a decision then that I'm going to be, do what boy thing, boy people do. Or yeah. we could think of many variations on that, couldn't we? Yeah. Uh, which may then get enacted out in later life, like you've just said. Yeah. I'm sure, like I said, you know, I think with these, he never directly said it to me. No. 
but right. just it was spoken about do you know what i mean that my like birth story was that he he always wanted a boy i think i was meant to be called graham well for you to know that and to be able to explicitly just say that it would be very unusual if um that that sort of injunction um hadn't been modeled down to you and i'd be very surprised if you hadn't made some sort of decision around that yeah another injunction which i think is just pretty negative as you say most of these are negative in fact yeah. all the 10 we're going to go through i think it's number four is uh don't express feelings a quite a common one in our culture because we have a quite a schizoid culture i think where yeah. we're withdrawn quite a lot uh, not like the italian say culture for example or the American culture, for example, I, I think I, I think the cultural script that we have mainly is about withdrawing, being reserved, keeping ourselves to ourselves, all those sorts of things. Yeah. And um, don't express feelings, which certainly was a model down in my house, but I wouldn't get any um, anything positive at all if I express feelings. And of course, you've got a variation of that. So. There might be something like don't express anger. Yeah. Or don't express sadness around here. Yeah. I was gonna say there were certain ones that it was okay for me to express and certain ones that I wouldn't, you know, it would say, Oh, don't be sad, mm. don't be angry, don't yeah. And somebody who's had an injunction modeled down to them about not express feelings, uh, will fit very well into a sort of boarding school profile. Because um the children that went to boarding um, schools often had that injunction really modelled down to them about oh. it isn't um, positive to express feelings because that would be seen as a weakness. So yeah. strokes whatsoever there. Um, and so you'd have to have a sort of be strong or uh, tight up a lip or whatever the phrase is you like. So don't express feelings is a very, very common one. Um, I think that was number six. Another one. Um, I wonder if we had we said don't be you said don't be yourself. Don't be close. Yeah. It's another one Eric Byrne talked about where the, where um, closeness intimacy um, was frowned on in the cult in the culture or the um, original family, for example, for could be for many different reasons. Uh, that the parents might have modelled that down. So the child then decides that uh, being a self-reliant loner or, or um, is the best way forward, for example. Yeah. And, um, being close to people was not what they got recognition from. So they are often enacted that out and might well feel overwhelmed with closeness. Yeah. In relationships as they get older. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know... I don't want to, you know, bad mouth parents or whatever, because I'm a parent and I'm sure I've got it wrong and everything, but it, it's kind of generational sometimes as well, because, you know, our parents had this, they went through something. So, you know, I was thinking, I know one of the ones that I can kind of relate to is don't be important. Oh yes, that's And I'm sure my mum had a don't be important, injunction that I've kind of inherited or picked up from her you know don't be important mm. yes yeah, it's certainly not about um, bad mouthing parents it's more about a, a psychotherapist model of understanding of that's it yeah trying to understand how you become the way you are yeah absolutely and I think a really good way is where you've just mentioned really it, it is the generational um passing down of these ways of being, if you yeah. like. Um, and it, it's, it's important to look at it that way rather than, you know, um, look at it in terms of parents' processes because, as you said, all parents, uh, you know, uh, aren't all bad, for example. <clears throat> these are often generational and uh, might come from the culture they live in as well. So there's many reasons or many traits but it's what the child decides yeah. that they enact out, which isn't useful for them nowadays. Yeah. It's the therapist's major task for looking at 
Yeah. No. And I, I think that's really important. And you said that at the beginning of this, Bob, that, you know, we do have a choice to, to pick this up and, and run with it ourselves. So it's not like it's done to us. We have a choice whether that's what we're going to do or it's not what we're going to do. So we play a part in it as well, which I think is quite important. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the literature going down, um, uh, and we're doing a podcast called Injunctions, but if you go right back to the beginning, Eric uh, Byrne called them Injunctions Stroke Decisions Complex. In other words, that the, the, there's always a decision. Yes. The child always decisions, even if it's Hobson's choice. Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. good thing to bear in mind that. Um so uh, don't grow up. Yes. Yeah. So often the this is a pa quite a powerful modelling when the mother or or the father um, wants to out of their awareness um, keep their child infantilised in a way uh, and not grow up so it can always stay with them and stay their baby girl. Or, yeah. You know. And this is out of awareness, but I was just thinking of um, only children, for example, who are so yes. wanted, so wanted that uh, it may be unconsciously hard, or even consciously hard, for one parent or even two parents to let the child go, if you like, or to be autonomous or to grow up. Yeah, and it was really done out of awareness. Because they're often so special, yeah. Uh, in a sort of only only child family, um, and we decide the child child might decide. Well, I'll have, I'll have to stay young then. Yeah, and that's it. It's done with the best of intention. In you, do you know what I mean? In that situation, like you said, it's an only child, and it's all they love them so much and everything. But yeah, the the understanding that we pick up about it it's like you're saying you know don't grow up the opposite of that is don't be a child we're you know we're expected to grow up and not have childlike traits from a really young age yes so the opposite of that is complete or don't be a child and then again you know uh there's lots of reasons why that might be modeled down if you could if you're in a big family for example yeah it might be important to be this be the um younger parent yeah you know, very very quickly yeah um, and also if out of awareness say one of the significant other people um had also had that injunction or that history of never being a child or not expressing child feelings i mean yeah. then out of awareness that would be passed on or could be passed on to uh, their own children, mainly mm. because you know the father or, or the mother might feel uncomfortable feelings and sadness around um, not having their own feelings expressed when they were a child. So there's many reasons those uh, messages might be passed down. But as you are quite correct, they're all negative. Yeah. Now, because. Because they, you know, it's like if they follow those uh, or if the child makes a decision, say, well, I'm not going to express feelings uh, or I'm, it, they, it's a survival decision because that's how they then get out on in the childhood. Uh, sorry, the, that's how they get on in their family. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, did you hear me? You went off. Yeah, uh, your podcast here is. You're freezing a bit, but yeah. Am I freezing as well? Yeah, you were then, but you're back again now. Okay. So, the important things that the TA therapist would look for, because I said as before, they all make up a healthy, sorry, unhealthy life plan, if you like, and get enacted out in life and all often call, cause problems for the yeah. person. So we look for those, and we also look for corresponding permissions that might be given, which we can call drivers, um, yeah. which isn't necessarily the subject of the podcast, but 
there are drivers that people that correspond to those decisions that people may follow automatically like hurrying up or trying hard or being perfect and we've been over them in various podcasts but in terms of injunctions which is specific in this podcast they're really important you know for a TA, TA therapist to think about what are the what's been the modeling by the parents that the child may pick up and follow to survive in the you know the family of origin that's really important because if you think developmentally if you're a developmental therapist and you think of how the past affects the present then you're going to be looking back at what decisions be modeled by the parents which the child may then pick up and and actually enact out as if it was their own decision yeah yeah one of the things i often you know in the early days when i'm getting to know a client and you know trying to work out the the script or the early decisions that they've made is you know what did you get praise for when you were growing up you know when you got praise what type of thing would you have been doing and kind of that gives me a bit of an idea towards the drivers and the injunctions you want to give an example of that Could what be? the type of thing that they would say well the the first thing is whether they're getting praise for being or praise for doing that oh. i ask do you know what i mean whether they're actually doing something or or you know just being you is enough and you were getting praise for it but it, it kind of just gives me a feel for what it was like for them. Yeah, and and if yes, and you would out of that get some information about or hypothesize about the modeling and the injunctions that were passed down to the child that they may then decide um, and underpins the way they live their life. Yeah. And in fact, as I said, a really important part is that the client takes the decision on as if it's theirs. Yeah. Rather than are aware that it's been passed down from their from their significant others. Yeah. It's a really important point. And because in therapy, if you help a person being aware of whose decision it was and whose message it was and what was modeled down then the client will be empowered by being able to separate separate out what was their decision and what actually was modeled down to them and that makes a big difference yeah absolutely yeah yeah i think when they have that realization do you know to me because if, if we've made the decision we can make a new decision we can decide something different if something I always kind of see it as if things aren't done to us, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like we're, I know it's difficult because we're a child and we're growing up and often it feels like we don't have much say in it, but we we always have a choice even in if things. It's choice. Yeah, exactly. That I love that phrase. Even if it's Hobson's choice, we do still have a choice. And that to me is really empowering. Even if we feel we haven't. Yeah. I use that phrase again, it's Hobson's choice. You know, it's a good thing to remind clients of at the right time. Yes. Yeah. Right, that's the bit. Yeah. The right time when they've done a lot of their own therapy work. Yeah. Yeah, because it is a difficult concept to understand. Why why would I choose to do that? Especially if it's, you know something negative or it's something that's causing them harm you know now why why would I choose to do that I can remember when I was working out things in therapy it didn't make any sense to me a lot of it and it's like peeling off different layers and going deeper and deeper yeah what didn't particularly make sense to you so the podcast listeners can um sort of hear the thought processes in your brain there for me, there was something about not being seen, but yet wanting to be seen. And it was like, a, do you know what I mean? It was like I was stuck and I couldn't win. I like to be invisible a lot of the time and not be the centre of attention, but yet 
I wanted to be the centre of attention. So it, it was kind of a, it always confused me. So there are two parts for you at, at war, if you want. Yeah, yeah. So I would just end up stuck a lot of the time. Yeah. So in TA, there's a word for that, uh, for people interested, and that's impasse. Impasse, yeah. Impasse is, you know, when you're stuck and there's two conflicting parts of the self at war. Yeah. Quite often as a therapist, you would put one part onto one chair and one part onto the other chair and help the client by role play explore the two different conflicting parts. Now, it's very important that you're trained how to do it. Yes. Listening to this, because it's something that um, is really taught quite intensely in, in training. It might be called chair work, could be called projection work, uh, could be called two chair work, but you need to be um, taught this, I think. Yeah, I've seen it done, but it's not something that I've ever done myself in, in a therapy session. Yeah. So it's very important to, I don't know when you, how you did it, Jackie, perhaps you did it through different methods and techniques, but to help the client be aware of the conflictual parts of the self and the impasse that they're actually in and to help them find a way through that impasse so they can find uh, a different quality of life Uh, and i you know i think that's a really valid point for any of the listeners that if ever you are feeling stuck and there are you know conflicting things going on then it's an impasse that's that's kind of where you are you just end up going round in circles you're not moving out of it yeah and i think with all these injunctions they're modeled down and the child takes them on and makes a decision that that's the way they're going to live their life. And they might even get reckon, some recognition from the parents from following that. But as they're unconscious modeling, it's usually the decision that they take and they see it as part of their identity. Yeah. And um, I think it's really important that, that, how can I explain this? The therapists help the person understand uh, the different traits they may have, the different injunctions that might be un- underpinning, you know, how they see their own identity. Yeah. Because once we can help clients get to that, and once ch- clients can see that usually that's been modelled down, it comes generationally from s- another place, they then can start to see how that mu- that, that way that they chose, which comes from a different generation perhaps, isn't helping them today. And then they can make with the therapist's help a different decision and a different destiny. Yeah. Yeah. And that that, you know, the the realization of all of that and then doing that work takes takes time to this kind of for me I think about there's a grieving process that goes on when we understand that and we want to let something go that theoretically might not be ours to hold on to in the first place. But yeah, there's, there's a, there can be quite a big shift when a client gets to that point. Have we ever, very, very important, have we ever done a podcast on the parent interview? No. Because this would be a part, if we get to that part you just talked about, where the client starts to realise that the central pillars of their identity is often ones they've had, they've chosen to, you know, take on board because it's from their significant other people and often for survival reasons, and they want to change this because it's unhelpful now. They often have to psychologically, psychologically. Now I'm not talking in real the real world here, talking psychologically, um, give it back to their parent. Mm. That decision, I mean. Yeah. I think, again, I've I've witnessed it in group therapy. I've seen it done in group therapy, yeah. Now, you do that by putting, or you could do that if the therapist is trained in this, by putting the significant other figure 
whether it's parent or whatever here, brother or whoever it is, there was perhaps the parent, and you would give back the the modelling back to them, like the modelling of, you know, you're not important. Yeah. And tell them that you are actually important and you're going to follow through in more healthy behaviours and decisions and let that go. Now, now not only um, do you have to, well, psychologically may talk to the parent, um, but you're right. Once you've done all that lot and worked through all that lot, may come a lot of sadness, mm. a lot of grief, a lot of yeah. loss. A link with that, it really does need to be what you're going to put in place yeah. of that negative modeling which was so destructive for you. Yeah. And that's a really that's a really important point, I think. Yeah, we need to replace it with something <laughs> positive. Yeah. Like, you know, it's okay to express feelings and the world won't clap. Yeah. That, it's okay for me to really take charge of how important and valuable I actually am and what that means differently in my world today. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the the, the podcast that we're going to do after this, I think leads on quite well from all of this stuff. Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. really important, I think. When we talk about injunctions, we see it in this light. Now, one of the... Uh, some of the comments which are left on our podcasts, I'd like to address here because I've been answering a few of them. One of them was by somebody who would like us to, um, you know, leave or say some books titles of where you can find these things because they found in some of the podcasts when I've talked about books, they found that very useful. So I'm going to mention one and you could mention one as well. Okay. There's so many. But I'm going to mention a textbook, and it's not a book that you read, you know, you get up and read and you put down. It's a bit like the Bible. I'm not saying it is the Bible, sorry, but you don't pick up the Bible and just read the Bible. You know, I, I was reading the Gospel of Matthew the other day, and I thought, I'll go on to the next Gospel, go on to the next one. But I realised it is not a book that you just read from A to B, A to Z, I mean. And it's the same here. It's a textbook, this, and it's called TA Today. And it was actually, oh, there she is. How is this magic? How did you know? So, people watching this on my YouTube, Shaq is put up TA today yes. by Ian Stewart and Van Joins. And I never knew after a year and a half of doing podcasts with me that she can read my brain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she has put TA today by Ian Stewart and Van Joins. Ian Stewart's, uh, you know, a Scottish psychotherapist and authored a lot of books, and Van Joins are well known. I think it's not California it comes from. I think I can't remember what parts of America it's come But the, they got together and they wrote this book in 1989. It became a textbook, really, for people, or students learning TAA. And um, to read it in bits and pieces is the best way to look at it. But there is a chapter on injunctions, chapter on drivers, chapter on eager state. So if you're interested in, you know, reading the theory more, that's a good book to point you to yeah my own on the manchester institute for psychotherapy website is um a section where i've reviewed 100 ta books and i think it's the number one that, yeah. I, that I actually reviewed so you can find the review on there as well but i think to understand um what underpins our personality and the way we make life decisions which might not be healthy for us, which usually aren't in terms of injunctions we're talking about, and how that then may cause problems today. It's a good reflection to think about injunctions. Yeah, yeah. I think it's one of the 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 basics that I talk a lot about. I often draw the diagram of. I know it, it, it's a classic diagram: the drowning man with the drivers and the injunctions at the bottom. I do that an awful lot for clients to try and explain you know what drives our behavior and what can kind of hold us back and how therapy works because sometimes you know if we've got a really strong be strong driver and we're told to not be strong anymore and to start to show emotions and talk it's kind of like we're cutting off one of the things that keeps us afloat whereas we need to be looking at the injunctions underneath 
in therapy rather than stopping the behavior we need to look at why we behave the way that we do <laughs> yeah. so that negative modeling that the child picks up and makes a decision about which then uh, becomes a negative decision in a person's uh, way they conduct their lives it's often uh, why people come to therapy yeah and i'm a big fan of, of educative therapy and someone again uh put the question which i thank for putting these questions on but was talking about how uh, they didn't think it was the job of a therapist to teach or impose um educative therapy on their class and i said i think back again well i totally agree i do not in any form or shape believe the therapy should impose anything on clients and in relational dialogue I think if the client wants to, it's really important, I think, to help a person look at how they, or help them understand how they become the way they are, which I call educative therapy. I'm not talking about posing it, I'm talking about a relational dialogue where both sides bilaterally yeah. agree. Yeah. And they find it very useful. I think so. Yeah. I don't think I've ever come across a client that hasn't want to, you know, explore certain things. And for me, and maybe maybe I am biased, but I, I work better with diagrams. I can explain things better. Um, so, yeah, but I, I do agree with what you're saying. It's not about imposing things onto a client. No, and I think the person who left the question for a valid, obviously from her, or I think it was a her experience, maybe with a therapist or maybe she if she comes from a very she i'm sure she pardon me if you say comes from a very client-centered position mm. uh, maybe there's a whole process around there and i think that like you most clients um you know found it useful and i always respect a client that says they don't want to absolutely so it's so it, it but i think most people uh, who are interested in what we're talking about in junctions here can find a really good chunk of theory which might, they might find interesting in that book TA today. Yeah, and I agree with what you're saying about dipping in and out of it. I don't think I've ever read it from cover to cover. I'm sure there's bits in it that I've still not read. But if ever there's something I want to know, this is my go-to and I do refer to it as a Bible because you can dip in and dip out of it, yeah. Yeah, very much so. And uh, it has, I think, two chapters on injunctions. But I wanted to talk about have a podcast on it because as a therapist, especially a TA therapist, um, you would look for these modelings of negative decisions which a client will pick up and may nap out in their life. And one of the jobs of a therapist is to help people become aware of that. And as I said, separate out so they can have a different destiny. Now, mm -hmm. Many of the people listening to this may be trained in a different modality altogether and will have similar language for this. Yeah. This is, but this is TA. This is what, you know, we, yeah, we do. So, so um, But it is an important, really important, I think, because in the end, the client then can, with the therapist's help, put a positive programming on the road positive decisions which will uh, underpin their personality and they probably will have to do the grief work with that yeah so thank you bob um until next time where we're going to be talking about script backlash and how to deal with it in therapy oh it's a wonderful subject yes so until then i'll speak to you soon see you bye 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 <laughs> You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.